We have Thomas Schneider now from the uh, University of British Columbia. We all know him now, by now. And he will be speaking, uh, giving a lecture on the conference summation, Egy Egyptological Reflections on the Exodus Conference and the Exodus through the lens of the Passover story in Exodus 12. Thomas, you are all yours. Thank you very much. So this paper attempts both to sum up the core ideas of the 40 plus papers presented at this conference and to propose yet another approach that has not received much attention over the past four days. First, I deeply appreciate the enthusiasm and the wide diversity of efforts undertaken by the speakers to elucidate the topic. Rather than being an impartial beholder, briefly paraphrasing every paper, I will instead offer you a concluding arrangement of topics that reflects my own interest in the topic. Over the past generation, modern historiography has seen an intense debate about the historian's engagement with historical sources, the nature and existence of historical facts, and the historian's ability or inability to read the past. Carlo Ginzburg, in his Menachem Stern lectures held in 1999 in Jerusalem and published as History, Rhetoric, and Proof, makes the following claim. Sources are neither open windows, as the positivists believe, nor fences obstructing vision, as the skeptics hold. If anything, we could compare them to distorting mirrors. The analysis of the specific distortion of every specific source already implies a constructive element. But construction is not incompatible with proof. The projection of desire, without which there is no research, is not incompatible with the restrictions inflicted by the principle of reality. Knowledge, even historical knowledge, is possible." End of quote. Few of us would probably share Ginsburg's optimism. Not only are sources such as the biblical text much more complex and refracted as to comply with the simple metaphor of a distorted mirror. To rectify the distortion, we would need to be aware of the historical reality in the first place. And as individuals deeply embedded ourselves in the stream of tradition that had its beginnings in the emergence of Israel, it may be more difficult than imagined by Ginsburg to reach an objective understanding of the different realities of the Exodus, its remembered and imagined histories. Many historians today would subscribe to the view that history is not so much knowledge of the past, but a responsible dialogue with what has been preserved from it. So here's a brief attempt at a conspectus of what that dialogue has been during the past four days. The grand narrative which the Exodus story is has been of momentous significance for ancient Israel, for Jewish identity, for Western thought, and for the formation of the academic discipline studying the ancient Near East. A revolutionary story about the origin of a people and a religion, as Jan Asman has emphasized, the Exodus narrative defines the promised nation of Israel in antithesis to a vilified Egypt. But it is also in contrast to an Egypt that was portrayed as a land of promise in the Joseph novella and that remained a land of promise to the Jews living in Hellenistic Egypt, the topic of René Bloch's paper. As a matter of fact, Egypt was to Israel and Judah a land of cultural promise and fascination throughout the first millennium BCE when it supplied them with artistic and religious inspiration, as highlighted in the papers that uh, Chris Hayes intended to hold here, and St Stefan Münger, and uh, some other peoples also um, um, ad, um, alluded to that uh, importance. This very first millennium BCE has also taken center stage in the debate on the Exodus within the last generation, both from the viewpoint of the textual genesis of the narrative and how Israel's cultural identity was legitimized by the memory of the Exodus. It is in the first millennium that, irrespective of any possible historical reality in the late Bronze Age, the Exodus event became a written and cultural artifact, a canvas of continued ideological imagination. Joel Allen, Peter van der Horst, and Baba Grahimi have demonstrated how crucial the Exodus text remained for later Jewish, anti-Jewish, and Islamic speculation. Separating the post-exilic and pre-exilic material from the priestly Exodus account has been the topic of Christoph Berner and Konrad Schmid's papers, who identified different layers of historical engagement with the narrative, uh, 
as did Stephen Russell's post-exilic contextualization of Exodus 18, 13 to 27. One might also add here Dan Fleming uh, in his attempt to um, contrast different Exodus narratives uh, and also Thomas Römer uh, with his um, attempt of uh, dealing with um, text on the worship of Yahweh. And it is important here to maybe um, single out um, Konrad Schmidt's important uh, distinction that we have to be very careful about the different worlds of the narratives and the very different worlds of narrators, and they were very different of such worlds uh, that uh, show up in the text. Retold, rethought, and reworked over several centuries, the Exodus account became a constructed history, to use a term by Robert Mullins, and its function as a text of cultural memory crucial to different historical audiences. Uh, and uh, this has been um, elucidated um, by an, or used as a vehicle of interpretation by Jan Asman, Ron Hendel, Aaron Mayer, Thomas Römer, Israel Finkelstein, and others. Um, as a matter of fact, the idea of memory is maybe the most frequently quoted idea or concept during that conference. A wide range of applications of that tool have been proposed. I just mentioned here the idea that there was a historical memory of a small group or individuals, that memory was a matrix for repeated exodoi from Egypt or from Canaan that later conflated, and also the idea that the exodus, the wonderful idea that it was a space of memory that was amenable to different uh, needs and necessities of later times. A diversity of ideas was also very present regarding the groups carrying that memory or its historical transfers, for example, to the Northern Kingdom. I won't go into all these details. I hope that they are all very present in your minds. While the prevalence of the Exodus narrative in biblical and post-biblical thought may have created an obsession with it in modern scholarship, as Baruch Halpern has argued, I do not think that academic hypotheses on it have remained unchanged as the vivid debate on its literary development and the aforementioned use of, as, of it as cultural memory has shown, much of which has been infused by recent paradigm shifts in biblical exegesis and cultural studies. The interest in the functions and reworkings of the narrative throughout the first millennium BCE has also triggered the question of how much inspiration ancient Egypt and, uh, could provide to Israelite and Judahite authors and editors of the Exodus story in the first millennium as it did in the case of the Joseph novella. This would have been the topic of Chris Hayes' paper on Judahite fascination and interchange with Egypt, and it has to some extent been reflected by Stefan Münger. In a similar vein, Israel Finkelstein has investigated the Iron Age period knowledge about the southern deserts, and uh, by whom, by what, to what purpose, and how such knowledge could have been imparted to Israel and Judah. I also want to emphasize here that this narrative saw uh, reactualizations in the first millennium in the light of Egyptian and Assyrian impact on the land of Palestine and Israel and the later Persian rule. And this, these reactualizations add to the fact that the earlier memories uh, were already biased by later attributions, as Aaron Mayer has so wonderfully shown. Moving from the commonly accepted view of the Exodus narrative having been reworked and reinterpreted back to its historical origins and to a possible historical event that might have triggered such a tradition has been acknowledged, I think, by the majority of us as much more problematic and controversial. Some speakers have commented on extra-biblical Exodus traditions, such as Ronald Redford in a lecture read by Antoine Hirsch, um, who denies the biblical account any primacy and reliability or supplementary information in later traditions on the biblical narrative, such as the Jewish Hellenistic historian Artapanus, discussed by Katharina Moro. On all accounts, however, and despite a more cautionary approach to texts since the linguistic turn, as Gerard Galvin has emphasized, the biblical Exodus narrative remains our main textual access to a possible historical core. Ron Hendel has underlined that the creation of identity was key to this account, at least in its initial form from the very beginning, when it helped in establishing and sustaining a peculiar people. Just 
who this people was in the early Iron Age is anything but clear and has been addressed in several papers of this conference by Avi Faust, who um, stressed also the importance to distinguish between the question of origin and the question of identity, by Brendan Benz, who uh, has been challenging conventional wisdom by assuming that early Israel comprised a contingent of geographical, economic, and political insiders. Dan Fleming has pointed to pastoralism as the pervasive feature of the Exodus and Joseph narratives, implying long-distance movement from the East to Egypt and back, and he has underlined this as an essential point of departure for all future debate. Bill Diva evoked Leopold von Ranke's famous dictum about the historian's quintessential task to demonstrate how it really was in the title of his paper, What Really Happened? Distinguishing between traces of historical knowledge, such as the wandering Aramean or the House of Joseph, the inventions and forgotten historical realities. And indeed, as you remember, a plethora of candidates for exodus groups has been proposed over the past three days, most of whom in conjunction with uh, models um, about the emergence of Israel as a social group, from oppressed insiders of Canaanite society to Shasu nomads or prisoners of wars returning from Egypt in a situation of desolation. desolation. Now, uh, the climax maybe of all these attempts has been Richard Feynman's attempt to identify the Levites and a very small group of them um, as the group leaving Egypt and transporting that memory to Israel. And Manfred Bitak has suggested the late Remicide period as the best fit for the biblical narrative, while he also has tried to contextualize later re-readings of the narrative in the Eastern Nile Delta. Now, most of us would probably agree that the kernel of the historical kernel of this Exodus memory is beyond reach. And most of us, I think, would possibly question um, if there is a case for a reconstruction of the paleogeographical situation in the Eastern Nile Delta and Egypt's northeast, northeast frontier, which would provide the topographical context for a potential historical core of the Exodus, as presented by Jim Hofmeyer and Stephen Mosher. Several scientific papers have just dealt with natural disasters. Rather than elucidating a literal event, the experience of such disasters may indeed have influenced the imagery behind the Exodus plagues and miracles, as it also appears in apocalyptic and ritual texts from the ancient Near East. So you, are, you already see where I'm, I'm, I'm going to steer. Most fittingly, Mark Harris has addressed today the fact that popular interpretations of the Exodus, shunning the scholarly debate, take the text as its face value and advocate apocalyptic interpretations based on natural catastrophes. They attest to a simplistic understanding of literature that neither reflects on the ideological uses of the text nor the adoption of literary genres and motifs to express such ideology. Bernard Bateau has portrayed Pharaoh and the Exodus as a source for Israelite mythopoetic -po uh, speculation, much more evocative than Babylon and the ex exile. Several other speakers have demonstrated the benefit of looking into Egyptian textual and religious parallels for ideas and motifs of the Exodus narrative. Susan Hollis, Gary Rensberg, and Scott Nögel. Uh, so they moved away from, this sim from a simplistic reading of the text to uh, the idea that um, the text has um, um, elaborated on literary motifs and parallels. Brad Sparks has assembled a large number of passages in Egyptian texts that Egyptologists compared to motifs in the Exodus story. If they do not point to, to genuine parallels, they at least um, attest or and are testament to the scholarly cultural uh, to the scholar's cultural familiarity and also their bias, uh, the biased nature of their approach by the Exodus narrative. My contention is that the formation of the Grand Exodus narrative in the first millennium BCE owes many of its themes and motifs to Egyptian texts and ideas, and that the editors of the narrative appropriated such texts and ideas for the Israelite cause. While Egyptian text has often been used for comparisons with biblical motifs, such texts were mostly taken from the well-published literature of the second millennium, hardly ever from the contemporaneous textual fund of post-New Kingdom Egypt. 
I also argue that because major parts of the Exodus narrative expose magical and ritual activities, the contest between Moses and Pharaoh, the plagues, the Passover ritual, the parting of the sea and the golden calf episode, we need indeed to compare later Egyptian magical and ritual texts as the most likely source of inspiration. Establishing this level of comparison may well shed significant light on the production of the Exodus narrative. So I want to move a bit forward here, like, like a, an outlook to what um, an, a new approach could do. And the case study I choose to demonstrate the relevance of this approach is the Passover story of Exodus 12, and in particular, the ritual put in effect to protect the Israelites. And I quote here from the New International Version of the Bible. On that, on that same night, I will pass through Egypt and strike down every firstborn of both people and animals, and I will bring judgment on all the gods of Egypt. I am Yahweh. The blood will be a sign for you on the houses where you are, and when I see the blood, I will pass over you. No destructive plague will touch you when I strike Egypt. Then Moses summoned all the elders of Israel and said to them, Go at once and select the animals for your families and slaughter the Passover lamb. Take a bunch of hyssop, dip it into the blood in the basin, and put some of the blood on the top and on both sides of the door frame. None of you shall go out of the door of your house until morning. When the Lord goes through the land to strike down the Egyptians, he will see the blood on the top and sides of the doorframe and will pass over the doorway, and he will not permit the destroyer, Mashrit, to enter your houses and strike you down. At midnight, the Lord struck down all of the firstborn in Egypt, from the firstborn of Pharaoh who sat on the throne, to the firstborn of the prisoner who was in the dungeon, and the firstborn of all the livestock as well. Pharaoh and all his officials and all the Egyptians got up during the night, and there was loud wailing in Egypt, for there was not a house without someone dead. I propose that the ritual to prevent the, the Mashrit, the, uh, the destroyer, from entering the house of Israelites, and instead having him kill the king's son, as well as the firstborn of all Egyptians and their animals, is actually an appropriation or even perversion of an Egyptian ritual aimed at that very protection. By removing the divine protection from the Egyptians, assigning it to Israel, and sending out his slaughtering demon, Yahweh shows his superiority over, and as the text says, brings judgment on all the gods of Egypt. An Egyptian ritual for the protection of Pharaoh at night, called Bedroom of the Palace, is preserved in the Theban Papyrus Carot 58027 of the late Ptolemaic period, and the birth houses of Dendra and Edfu, where the ritual is transferred to the protection of the child gods of Greco-Roman temples. When the original text was composed is unclear, although the division of the text follows the New Kingdom and later books of the underworld. Elements of the ritual are also attested in, ver in a variety of other ritual texts that are more specifically conceived to offer protection from the annual plague after the Nile inundation and for mothers and their newborn children. The ritual of the Cairo Papyrus offers protection of the pharaoh during the 12 hours of the night. It contains a specific recitation for each hour of the night when a protective deity is invoked who has to ward off malevolent demons that would harm pharaoh. Pharaoh himself is equated with a specific god in every hour so as to assume divine powers himself. The standard wish of protection is as follows, I quote, may you be vigilant in your hour, may you watch over Pharaoh, may you spread terror among or make tremble those who are in the deep night, may you keep the wanderers away from his bedroom, end of quote. The malevolent demons are called Shemayu, roamers, wanderers, in related texts also slaughterers and knife demons, and are seen as being sent by Sachmet or Bastard, variant appearances of the goddess of plague and pestilence. The first designation used for the demons, those who are in the deep night, uses an Egyptian term, Usha, denoting the hours around midnight. When according to other texts, Osiris was believed to have been killed and Re was most remote on his nocturnal journey. For the sixth hour leading to midnight, the Theban papyrus is not preserved. In the later versions from Dendra, the pharaoh is indeed identified with the underworldly Osirian form of Re and is protected by Isis and Min, whereas the attacking demon is uh, the, the safe animal. The demonic nature of the Mashrit of the Passover account has often been uh, mentioned in the scholarly literature. He strikes blindly and, as opposed to Yahweh, does not tell the Israelite houses from the Egyptian ones. 
The blind ravaging is famously described in Egyptian texts. In the Book of the Heavenly Cow, Sachmet has to be averted from killing the humans by a trick. A field is flooded with beer made to appear like blood by mixing it with red ochre, and the bloodthirsty Sachmet thus becomes drunk and placated. The hemorrhologies of the New Kingdom indicate for the third month of the inundation season, day 20, I quote, coming forth of Bastet, the Lady of Anchtawi, uh, which means the, the, the life of the two lands, in front of Re, so furious that the god could not withstand in her proximity. Interesting also the parallel here between Yahweh, who has this to send a blind, slaying destroyer. Whoever is born on this day dies of the plague of the year. The text of the hourly recitations is followed by a detailed description of the ritual procedure. Images of the protective deities invoked for the successive hours of the night were drawn in ochre around the king's bed, and additionally, an uttered eye in front of the bed in whose pupil the king had to be seated at the beginning of the ritual, more likely a figurine of the king. Moreover, the recipient of the ritual was anointed with a spe special unguent, and the same anointment was to be placed on all windows of the house. The protection of the windows and the doors of houses in this way is also attested in a number of similar rituals, among which the ritual against the plague of the year inflicted by Sahmet after the Nile inundation. A version of the later, later ritual is indeed added to the present text for the bedroom of the palace. The correlation also exists in many other texts. So I just skip here uh, many texts where this is also mentioned. In one of these texts, however, um, this um, destruction is also averted from cattle, birds, and the fish in the Nile. In Exodus 12, the Passover demon slays human firstborns as well as the firstlings of the Bohemah, a term used for cattle, domestic livestock, and animals in general. Instead of all the firstborn and firstlings of Exodus 12, the note from the aforementioned Egyptian calendar of lucky and unlucky days more specifically says that all newborn children will necessarily die from the plague. Interestingly, William Propp quotes Jubilees from 49.15 from the 2nd century BCE as articulating Pesach's primal significance. I quote him, or quite the book of Jubilees, uh, the plague will not come to kill or to smite during that year when they have observed the Passover in its appointed time. The fluid placed on the windows and doors respectively is different in the two traditions, ointment versus blood, which may be explained by the different ritual meaning of sacrificial animals in Israel and Egypt. In the Passover ritual, the slaughtered sheep or goat is a substitutional sacrifice for the spared human victim. In Egypt, the sacrificial animal represents instead the enemy or the demonic force itself. Putting blood on the doors only makes sense in the former case, where the demon needs to be made to believe that the human victim has already been slain. While other Middle Eastern rituals have been adduced to explain the Pesach ritual, such as the Arabic fidya or redemption ritual, the Egyptian ritual text quoted give it the ancient Egyptian context that the Exodus narrative presupposes. This context provides a close parallel between the protection of Pharaoh's house against demons sent by Sachmet and of Israelite houses against the demons sent by Yahweh. It also explains why Pesach is performed just before nightfall and why slaying the firstborn could be seen as a judgment on the Egyptian gods who had failed as the protective deities of the 12 hours of the night. In about three minutes, I hope that is fine. As a side note, let me draw your attention to the invocation of a protective god of the 11th hour of the night, Horus of Dawn, which states, you are the perfect golden calf belonging to the breast of Hathor, the appearance of the lord of the sky and of the two lands, the lord of the land of turquoise, that means the land of the Sinai. It may be interesting to further explore this tradition of Horus as the golden calf and lord of the Sinai in the context of the golden calf episodes. The Egyptian parallels proposed here need further study, in particular with respect to the time and the context in which they could have become known to the authors or editors of the biblical text. But in light of the interest that such texts provide for the study of the Exodus narrative, I would like to use Chris Hayes' term of Egyptian rapprochement for a desirable reorientation of Exodus scholarship towards post-New Kingdom Egyptian textual parallels for a narrative that is indeed situated in Egypt and thus it was composed and reworked during this very first millennium. In his paper on Saturday, Jim Hofmeyer deplored the fact that, I quote, 
By the mid-20th century, Egyptology's love affair with Old Testament matters had soured, and he had issu had is has issued a pressing call for Egyptologists to return to the debate to bring data from Egypt to bear on historical and geographical matters. I would instead say data from Egypt to bear on textual and literary matters. In Exodus 16.3, the Israelites complained to Moses and Aaron, if only we had died by Yahweh's hand in Egypt. There we sat around pots of meat and ate all the food we wanted, but you have brought us into the desert to starve this entire assembly to death. To understand the historical realities of the narrative about Israel's way out of Egypt, we need to do what the Israelites were denied, were denied to return to Egypt, from the dearth of evidence on the side of biblical scholarship to the meat pots of Egyptology. Thank you so much. Well, we have time for just uh, one or two questions. Aaron? Um, a, pr a possible interesting parallel, how you see this as a, uh, a counter to a, um, a religious um, um, ritual to, for protection. Um, the story of the Ark of the Covenant in Philistia, where it's a, it's a clash between the gods. Um, uh, I've tried to show it also in a, in a context of the archaeology of the Levant, um, but there it's as if they're countering something that the Philistine god would do in something that to a certain extent is like a plague, um, whatever happened to them, you know, wherever it happened on their body. Right, right, thanks so much, yes. Yes. <laughs> Thank you very much, Thomas, this is very interesting. Um, of course, there seems to be um, sort of a parallel, strongly, between this ritual for the Pharaoh and the Amduat and a parallel with protection against death uh, and sleep as a kind of form of death. Um, I really like your layout of uh, the different means of sacrificial animals, and I think that's fundamental in keeping uh, the symbolism and the conversions apart, mm -hmm. because they do have quite a different meaning. Um, I was wondering uh, how, how you explain the ointment as a protective fluid rather than the blood? Um, well, that's a good question. Um, we, in, in this very specific case, we have a very elaborate, um, basically, recipe for the ointments consisting of, I think, up to 20 ingredients. Unfortunately, none of the ingredients has been identified, so different plants. Um, I'm not sure, but um, Ointments um, certainly um, were um, a, a luxury product that also, in a sense, embellished the bodies of gods, of humans, etc. That um, um, the fragrance has a, a div divine quality, right, of, of ointments. So maybe that is uh, the, the 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 way we would have to go here. But uh, it would be important to know what the ingredients were of that of that uh, of that ointment, and to see if. Um, that has the, uh, these these plants also have any specific meaning, but I simply I didn't have the time to go into into all these these plant names right before that this talk. 